Destination Freedom. Destination Freedom, dramatizations of the great democratic traditions of the Negro people, is brought to you by Station WMAQ as a part of the pageant of history and of America's own Destination Freedom. Of many outstanding ships that plowed the seas between battlefront and home front during World War II, none had greater significance for the American dream of human brotherhood than the Liberty ship S.S. Booker T. Washington. And for the story of the captain of that ship, Destination Freedom presents its chapter, Keeper of the Dream, the story of Captain Hugh Mulzac, skipper of the S.S. Booker T. Washington. Now the bitter war has been ended, Four years gone, but the wharfs round New York are still crowded with cargo waiting for ships to carry it over the ocean, especially now when sunlight's ready to rise over the top of the skyscrapers. The sleeping ships sort of open their eyes and stretch and groan and get ready. A coal ship calls over to a passenger liner. A foghorn grunts way out in the bay, and the harbor's awake the way seamen like to see it. Crowded, crammed with ships coming in and ships going out. With crewmen coming down the docks, laughing, groaning, or telling the multi-million tales about seamen. And sometimes in the early morning, when they're hoisting their bags over their shoulders and looking out across the bay for the ship, they see him on the dock. They nod their heads, they talk of him of this skipper without a ship who comes down to the docks at daybreak and looks out at the sea. They talk of how he walked across the docks and up the stairs of the hiring halls of the Maritime Union, walked slowly through the room full of sailors, talking, smoking, lounging, waiting, and listening to the voice of the dispatcher who auctions off a berth on a boat in exchange for work. Here now, here now, sailors, sailors, listen here now. There's a ship in the harbor calling for one fireman and two wipers. One and two. How about it, man? A fireman and a wiper in the house? Well, how, where's she going? Where's she going? Where's she going? Where's she going? Oh, she's going on a long, long run to a cold, cold place. Who wants to go on a long, long run to a cold, cold place? What fireman? What wiper? Oh, she's hot, she's feeding, she's sleeping, and she's ready to go. Ready to run. Hold it. I'm ready. Hold it, me. You? You? Yeah, I'll come right up, right up. I need a one and a two. Yeah, one fireman and two weapons. Now, listen to this one. Oh, here's the one that's needing the cook. The skipper oh, looked over men who had once sailed under him. And he looked towards well, the dispatcher well, who had well, sold them on his ship. And now they say the dispatcher noticed the skipper but looked off towards the other side of the room. Now, now, here's a long, long run up to a tropical place. She's needing a cook, a steward, a fireman, and she's awaiting the sail. Who wants to ride? Who wants to ride? The dispatcher kept his back to the skipper, but when he looked down to see what seaman had come to take the run, he saw the skipper. Oh, oh, uh, you, uh, well, you, you misunderstood me, skipper. I was calling for a cook or a steward. I cook. Well, I'm not the one who will send one of the best skippers in port to the galley. A uh, skipper's a man, too, dispatcher. Well, do I doubt it? A man's got to eat. But not Jim Crow. Uh, skipper, I don't know what's happened since the war that turned everything upside down again. I don't know who's to blame. But in my books, you're a skipper. And every man in the hall, you're still the master. I still need the job. Well, the sea still needs good skippers. Now, now listen. Down near uh, 23rd is Meriwether Shipper. They've been crying for masters to take the ships out. I've heard. Well, give them a try before you sign out as cook. I've tried, <laughs> dispatcher. I won't. Please. For an old water tender who once sailed with you to Vermont. Try Meriwether's first, huh? All right. I'll try it. I'll go. And while the dispatcher went back to supplying ships with seamen, the skipper went out to search for a berth. He walked the planks along the docks until he came to the sign of the shippers. They tell how he walked inside and how the clerk was concerned. You, you're sure this is your master's license, sir? Quite sure. You need a master? We do need a ship's master, sir, but... Yes? Well, I'll have to take this up with the president of the company, Mr. Merriweather's Inn, now. Uh, 
If you'll just wait here, I'll tell him about you. Excuse me, Mr. Merriweather, but there's a skipper outside. Don't who, keep uh... him waiting, Hamlet. We need skippers. You're new here, but matters like hiring can be done without coming into the president's office. The papers of that skipper out there show he sailed for 40 years, sir. The kind of a man we need. And he's been to every shipper's office except ours. Uh, something wrong with him? Uh, he's a Negro. Oh, I see. Something is wrong. Well, shall I sign him on, sir? You're not that new, Hamlet. Send him off. I, I would, sir, but... What? Well, there's a fair employment practices law in this state, and I'd rather not face being charged with, with, well... Discrimination? Well, some misunderstanding person might accuse us, especially if we don't examine his application. Uh, I'll handle him. After all, Meriwether's qualifications are the most exacting in the state. I'll measure him myself. Certainly, sir. And Hamlet. Uh, sir? Leave that application of his. Oh, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'll study them before he comes. If other shippers have dodged him, there must be plenty of weak history in these papers. I couldn't find any, sir. Naturally. That's why I, and not you, command this company. Hmm. Hmm? I see. Foreign born. Send in Mr. Malzac, Hamlet. Right, Mr. Marijuana. And they tell how the company commander scanned lightly over the skipper's papers and just as lightly over the thin, lean man who came into his office. Your Malzac? Mm, sit down. Thank you. As you've heard, no doubt, Merriweather's makes it a practice of hiring only the best trained and educated shipmasters. I know. I say all that to say don't be disappointed if we find your application doesn't quite, not quite come up to the standards Merriweather sets. Our cargoes are costly. We get every detail in the history of our skippers before we take them on. Is that agreeable? I should think so. Good. Skipper, in reading over your application, I see you were born in the West Indies. On the island of St. Vincent. My father was a shipbuilder. I got to sea in my veins very early. Uh-huh. Uh, why did you come to this country? I came here, well, searching for something. Oh? Oh, I had heard America was the land of the free and the home of the brave. On the little island where I was born, there was quite a bit of freedom, too. But uh, America was different. From the West Indies? So quite. I said I'd come to this great free land as soon as I could. You booked passage on a ship? No, I was young. My father wanted me to stay in the islands and inherit the business he'd built. I got away the best I could. And how was that? I knew about the ways of the sea and about ships. You'll notice on my papers it says I first came to this country in 1910. doesn't say how. It doesn't say anything about the Welsh spice ship that stopped at my island that year. And when it took off again, I was on it. For 20 miles out at sea, I was the only one who knew it. I was a thin, underweight boy of 16 who had crawled aboard that ship. I knew no one would look for a stowaway inside the captain's cabin in the deep closet back of the captain's bunk. Whenever the captain came to his cabin... I throw the man down, a fleshy policeman I transport I would peep through the cracks and see he was a giant of a man, red beard and a bull shoulder. I was hungry. I was afraid I'd be discovered whenever he threw his frame down on his bunk. I waited until I heard him sleep, and I tried to keep the bottles of rum and gin and brandy from falling about me while I kept my mind off my empty stomach and wondered if I could hold out until I reached the free land, America. But just 40 miles out, the red beard stopped fluttering. The giant hand reached sleepily toward the closet. I saw it pick its way between the gin and brandy as though it had eyes and fasten on the rum. The bottle lifted out past my face. It was raised neck down over the captain's head, and when it was half empty, it came back my way and was put neatly in its place. Went this way until we were 60, 80, or 100 miles out. But once, when the captain left his cabin, I crept out of the closet to stretch and chew some hardtack I had with me. Then I heard the captain come in. I tried to scamper back into the closet. I made it, but before I could get my place again, I'd knocked over the bottle, and I'd just time enough to set him up again before he was inside. Before he'd thrown himself at his bunk... 
before he'd reached toward the closet, felt his way and picked out a bottle, raised it above his head, neck down, then discovered... <coughs> uh, who's been in here? Who's been in my closet? I'll have his neck broken for this. The cook got my bottles. I know it. Cook! Cook! I had placed the bottles in the wrong position. He'd taken a drink of liniment. He reached in, and I couldn't pull away from his arm. Oh, what's this? Who is this? It's, it, it's me, sir. Oh, come out of there. He jerked my arm half out of its socket and stood me on the floor. Shook me until my head spun and kept saying... I'll snap every bone in your thieving body. Now, come on. What are you doing in here? I... Who put you on here? I, I did. Someone helped you. No, no one helped me, honest. Where did you get on? At... St. Vincent Island, from my home. Who are your folks? The Mulzacs. Oh, kin to old Kurt Mulzac, the shipmaker? Yes, sir. Well, blow the devil down if you don't resemble him. You could be telling the truth. What are you stowing away for? I want to get to the United States. What for? I, I don't know, sir. I, I just hear it's a land of opportunity. It's free. I, I want to be free. Well, the crewmen had heard the racket inside and were knocking to see what had happened. The captain told them, Break that door down and I'll break your head. Hey, anything wrong, Captain? Say, who you got in there? Stowaway? <laughs> we can get rid of him for you, Captain. We're docking in Granada in an hour. We can toss him off. The captain looked at me for a long time before he made up his mind. Get back to your jobs, men. But ain't he a stowaway, Captain? He's just a green child going out into the world looking for freedom. Yeah. Go to your jobs, men. They went back to their jobs. They left the captain still shaking his head. Green children get in my way. I don't know why I'm keeping you on. Well, thank you, Captain. It's not for thanks. Maybe because I can't... The captain puzzled over his own softness. He thought of the resemblance between my actions and his, and he took me into his confidence and taught me navigation and seamanship while the rigor crawled to China, India, Australia and back around the Cape Horn to South America. And on a sunny day in May, 1910, it crept up to the country I'd dreamed about. Well, there she is, lad. There's your first look at the United States. Is... is all of that it? Well, there's some more up north and some more west, if we go by way of the Gulf. This port's the good city of Wilmington, North Carolina. You've been here before? More times than I got fingers and toes. Oh, bless Slim, it's Sunday. Say, I'll tell you what. I'll take the day off and sort of show you around. Come on. The captain took me down into the streets of Wilmington, through the busy square, and let me stare at the sea of white, black, brown, and tan faces in the street. He turned off to a side lane and walked with long strides until I had to ask him... Oh, well, where, where, where are we going, Captain? No, don't be telling me you've forgotten what day it is. Sunday. Slim's day. The Sabbath is one day I never let pass without giving thanks to Slim. The captain always referred to the Lord very intimately as Slim. And we went looking for and found the house of Slim's on Bellum Street. Never mind the denomination. It's Slim's place. I can tell by the cross. Take your hat off in his presence. Uh, here's an usher. Uh, do you wish your feet, sir? Uh, two, if you don't mind. One, sir. Two. For me and the lad here. The lad? Yes, yes, you see him. Well, he can't come in here. This church is not for Negroes. There are no mixed churches in Carolina. What are you talking about? Oh, of course, I know you seamen don't come around church enough to know the regulations. But if you leave your boy outside, you're perfectly welcome to come in. Just come this way. The usher walked away. It seemed as though a yard arm had struck me. I... I, I thought I must have done something, something wrong. I'd never been discriminated against before. I stumbled away, and the captain called the usher. You call me, sir? Why can't the boy come in? Well, I've explained the best I could. Now, you come in. No. I'll stay out, too. If the lad isn't allowed to come in, it's because Slim isn't in there. And since Slim isn't in your house, we'd all do better on the outside. May Slim have mercy on your narrow soul. We went back to the ship. We went back aboard together, and the captain never called me green again. I'd been baptized by bigotry. 
I never told you about the ray system here. I, I didn't think you'd meet it so quickly. I didn't want to kill your dreams. I've had them when I was green. My dreams are not dead. Yeah, they will be. There's more dis race discrimination here than in any port you sail to. There's restriction on your voting, on your running for public office in some states, on your education and your holding jobs. Uh, I'd, I'd hoped I could hold it from you, lad, for a while longer at least. I took the long way around the globe before bringing you here. Well, Stowaway, you want me to take you back home? No. This is going to be my home. The land isn't as free as they say. It's no home for you. I'll make a home. Then I'll help make it free. I'm going ashore. I went ashore. Although I'd found the dream damaged and distorted, I'd wanted it too long to give it up without a struggle. I left the ship, and I made America my home. I sailed all over the world, but I always came home again. The rest, sir, you have on my application. The skipper sat in the ship owner's office and told the story between the lines of his application. The ship owner said, All that's very interesting. But where did you get your master's license? The captain took me to Wales. I finished Swansea Nautical College there. Then you shipped as a master? Then I shipped wherever I could get a berth. Quartermaster on a steamship, mate on a fruit ship, deck jobs on schooners, a steward, or cook on steamships. They avoided respecting my master's papers. Indeed. Well, you see, Skipper, we only take men who've had master's experience. I had that. Ten years of it. You just said... I said at first there were only the deck jobs and steward's jobs. Then a man named Marcus Garvey dreamed of reconquering Africa for the Africans. He opened a steamship line. I was Skipper of his ships. I remember Garvey. His crews were all Negro. They were. Well, until we collected such a crew for you. I didn't come looking for such a crew. Well, now, to be frank, Skipper, with race prejudice being what it is, we can't trust mutiny with a mixed crew under a Negro captain. That's what they said at first. Who were they? The War Shipping Administration. When war broke out, when the Atlantic was thick with Nazi submarines and our ships were sunk faster than they could be built... There was a desperate call for all sea captains. I came. The administrator looked over my record as you're doing. His answer was... After checking this license in your record, there's only one reason why you've not been called before. You've been the victim of rank discrimination. We are putting an end to it. I'm ready for that. Good. Within a few weeks, Skipper, we're launching a new Liberty ship on the West Coast. The SS Booker T. Washington. A good name. A good ship if you can round up enough qualified Negro seamen to make a crew. Do I have to sail only with a Negro crew? Isn't that what you want? All I and other Negro skippers want is a chance to sail at our ratings. We don't want segregation on the seas. If the Booker T. Washington's going to be a Jim Crow ship, I won't be the master of it. I see you mean that. All right. You take the Booker T. Washington and get any crew you can. If you master it, the ship is yours. Go get her. When the Booker T was commissioned at Los Angeles, October 15, 1942, she sailed down the Mexican coast with men from 17 states. Men from Canada, the Philippines, Greece, Scotland, Peru, England. Black men, yellow men, red men, brown men. From North, Central, and South America. Men from Asia and Oceania who had heard the dispatcher's call. Oh, look, here's a new, new ship that's calling for cooks, firemen, stewards, deckhands, any hands, all hands. Where's she going? Why, well, she's going on an unknown run to an unknown place. And she's a brand new Liberty with a brand new skipper. Who'll sign on? Who'll I'll sign it. It. I'll I'll All right, then step right up and lay down your John Henry sailors, because she's feeding, she's sleeping, and she's ready. She's a new ship with a new skipper, and she's feeding, she's sleeping, she's ready. I had the Liberty ship feeding and sleeping, and the men scrambled up the gangplank as they'd scrambled up a dozen ships before mine. When I called them together on deck, some of their faces showed surprise when they saw that mine was brown. They had questions to ask. I had only a few things to say. I can't answer any questions about where we're going or how long we'll be gone, men. You all know this is another Liberty ship, and you all know wherever we go, it'll be dangerous. You know how many seamen have been killed by enemy action while delivering the tons of supplies, soldiers, and equipment to the fighting front? 
5,000 so far. No one knows whether this ship or any ship comes through. That's all your new skipper's got to say. Go to your job. Oh, yes. There is one more thing you men should know about this ship. It's different from any ship that sails the seas today. It's one of the few spots in all our war efforts that isn't Jim Crow. When Negro and whites and men of all races and all nations get a chance to really work together in harmony. To me, this harmony is the cargo I'm concerned about most. If we deliver it, it'll show more people the way to victory and security than all the bombs the ship will hold. That's all. There's rough weather ahead. That was all the talk there was. That was the night when the SS Booker T. Washington slipped out of New York Harbor and joined the convoy. We picked up survivors from lost ships who told grim stories of wolf packs waiting for us. We ran into a storm that broke our cables and caused our cargo to shift. It blew for three days, and on the fourth, I risked taking the Booker T. out of the convoy and ran alone with the wind, dodged the submarines that kept on our tracks. Saw the curious faces of the men, black and white and brown, grow fearful as they watched me direct the ship. I kept a 24-hour watch in the crow's nest and forward and aft on the flying bridge with the whole gun crew at standby. And I raced her alone for seven days and on the eighth shook the subs off my trail. And on the ninth day, a shot cut across our bow. It was the most welcome shot I'd ever heard. It was from the harbor patrol of Belfast, Ireland. We were two days ahead of our convoy. We had brought the ship to her destination. That shot cemented the crew. A crew, no band of saints, no company of fanatic volunteers, just, just the common run of men who had then found it easier to fight for each other than against each other. We ran for five years back and forth across the Atlantic again and again, until the Booker T was known in Allied ports as the ship Jim Crow couldn't sink. And a poet, Langston Hughes, traveled with the ship from Maine to Murmansk and summed up the hopes and dreams of the crew and its skipper. Dangerous are the western waters now, and all the waters of the world somehow. Again, mankind has lost its course, been driven off its way, down paths of death and darkness, gone astray. But there are those who still hold out a chart and compass for a better way. And there are those who fight to guard the harbor entrance to a brighter day. There are those, too, who for so long could not call their house their house, nor their land their land. Formerly the beaten and the poor, who did not own the things they made, nor their own lives, but stood individual and alone, without power. They have found their hour. But backward is the land where Nazi fear has taken hold and tyranny again is bold. We Negroes have been slaves before. We will not be again. Alone, I know no one is free. But we have joined hands, black men with white men, I with you and you with me. Together we have launched a ship that sails these dangerous seas. But more than a ship, our symbol of new liberties, we put a captain on the ship's bridge there, a man. Spare, swarthy, strong, four square. But more than these, he, too, a symbol of new liberties. And there's a crew of many races, too, many bloods, yet all of one blood still, the blood of brotherhood. And deep determination, geared to kill the evil forces that would destroy our charts, our compass, and bellboy, that guides us toward the harbor, the new world we will to make. The world where every ugly past mistake of hate and greed and race will have no place. In union, you, white man, and I, black man, can be free. More than ship, then, Captain Mulzac, is the Booker T. And more than captain, you who guided on its way, your ship is mankind's deepest dream, daring to see. 
Let the winds rise then. Let the great waves beat. Your ship is victory and not defeat. Let the great waves rise and the winds blow free. Your ship is freedom, brotherhood, democracy. There were other words sent to us, too, from Franklin D. Roosevelt and from admirals and generals. In the war, we found that Jim Crow was a straw man. When the war was won, some ships settled back into their harbors. Some skippers were retired. All Negro skippers, mates, and licensed men were suddenly turned back to the beach. They're still on the beach. They're still looking for a berth. That's my application, Mr. Merriweather. I see what you're driving at, Skipper. And don't think I don't sympathize. Sympathize? But uh, the the kind of experiment you want, well, it's not practical for peacetime. After all, there's the profit of the cargo to be considered and the fact that, well... Age-old prejudices can't be ended overnight. And, well, in short, Skipper, I'll keep your application on file. But the time, the time's not, not quite right yet. Understand? I see. Now, back on your island, we've got, well, a ship that might suit you. If you care to stay out of the States for some time. Understand? I understand that there are still people in America, in the land I dreamed of coming to since I was a boy, who believe that democracy was merely a wartime maneuver, that the loss of millions of men and women was but to build a stronger status quo of discrimination and segregation. No. I say the symbol of the Booker T. Washington was the dream I came to America for, the dream that America must become truly the land of the free and the home of the brave. I came here for that. I remain here for that. And they tell the story around the docks of New York of the 250 Negro officers in the United States Merchant Marine during the war. Today, every one of them has been stranded and left on the beach. They can find work neither at sea nor ashore. Yet, there are 1,181 merchant vessels flying the American flag today. What these Negro seamen want is that the flag of Jim Crow be pulled down from these ships and that the flag of democracy be hoisted. Until it is hoisted, these men walk alone, searching for jobs. But no, not alone. For with them walk thousands of the people of America who too are fighting to make the American dream come true. You have just heard Destination Freedom's dramatization of Keeper of the Dream, the story of Captain Hugh Mulzak of the famed S.S. Booker T. Nation Freedom is written by Richard Durham and produced under the direction of Homer Heck. The role of Captain Hugh Mulzak was played by Maurice Copeland. Others were Dean Almquist, Oscar Brown, Jr., George Kluge, Fred Pinkard, and Russ Reed. The special music was composed by Amos Soderstrom and was played by Elwin Owen and Jose Bethencourt. Sound effects were by Cliff Mueller, and the engineer was Gary DeVlieg. This is Hugh Downs inviting you to be listening again next week when Destination Freedom will tell the story of Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, the first permanent settler of Chicago. <laughs> You're tuned for the stars on NBC.